Here we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry, and all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all been working for the last 25 to 30 years. We work with just about every major publisher and publication in the business, and we've published somewhere between 50 and 100 books between us. We've all taught illustration at the university. Each week, we pick a fascinating topic on illustration, and we battle it out. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time, you're going to learn something brand new. Cool. Well, let's get right down into it, fellas. Um, have you ever... <laughs> <laughs> I disagree right off the bat. Whatever you're going to say. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> 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 no, you, here's what I was going to say is this, have you ever abandoned a project or is everything you've started out gone on into production and, and become old, you know, something tangible, somebody can yeah. experience. I have, I have a, um, I have folders full of projects that I've started and not finished. I've finished every single thing <laughs> I've ever thought about to its <laughs> logical finale. It's let me ask you, let me ask you this, <laughs> Lee, what, um, is there any one of these things that you've abandoned? I would say, what's the ratio to the, to the projects you've abandoned? You could answer this too. Well, what's the ratio of ones that you're like, I'm glad I abandoned it to versus ones that you're like, man, I wish I could figure out a way to finish that mm. the ratio there. Hmm. I mean, I guess I'm always, I don't know if I have that exact ratio, but I'm always, there's always a reason that I abandon something. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, if I felt strongly enough about it for whatever reason, I wouldn't abandon it or I would revisit it. Now there are some projects that I do want to revisit that I haven't quite figured out all the way. I mean, that's my mm -hmm. number one reason for abandonment, right? It gets to about 85% or 80%, but it's not quite there. And, and, and so I just, I just shelve it because I get so busy with something else. And then it just sits there and I, you know, longingly, sometimes I'll open these folders and it's surprising how many projects there are in there. Um, I thought you were going to say, how many do you abandon versus how many do you complete? And that <laughs> would be probably a, a 10 abandoned projects to one completed. If I'm lucky. Okay. okay. And, and, and if I'm, I would agree if I'm counting like the ideas that just were ideas that I didn't really even work on, mm -hmm. you know, like, like I I'm in my sketchbook and I'm like, Oh, it might be cool to do something like this. Mm -hmm. And then for whatever reason, I don't, but yeah, there's, there's uh, I think that um, I think for creative people, you have to come up with, in order to come up with gems, you have to come up with a lot more ideas that, that, that at least start or begin in your mind. They, they might not even make it to paper, but, I think you have to sift through a lot of ideas and, and I, I would point to the late great author, Rick Walton, who had written, I think, I think at one point right before he died, he had told me he had written 1100 stories, but he had a little <laughs> over a hundred published, you know, so about one in 10. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, for every one project, there's 10, 10 abandoned ones. I I'd say that ratio works too. And I would say like, I'd say the majority of them are ones that I wish I could still figure out like how, how to make them happen for me. There's a fear where I'm just like, ah, I don't care if I ever, that was mm -hmm. for made by a different person at a different time. I don't need to return to it, but, um, I want to dig into that a little more. Um, I was thinking about this because a couple of years ago I was working on a children's book idea. And had a great premise for this children's book idea. And, and I was working with my editor on it. She liked it too. Um, prior to that, we had come up, you know, she's like, throw me out some ideas that you have, throw out some ideas. And I kept throwing out ideas and they weren't landing and they weren't landing. You know, I'd make a, I'd make a one or two book dummies and it just wasn't working. And then I came up with this idea and, and we went through and we did, 13 different book dummies versions of it 
before finally abandoning it. And I was just thinking like, why ultimately, why did that project get abandoned? How come it didn't become a, a children's book? And why can't I uh, revisit it? Why can't I revise it? Why can't we come back to it? And so I want to unpack that today with you guys. Reasons to abandon it, why it's okay to abandon something, and how to, um, I would say, how to like revive a project if, if there's reasons to do that as well. The first thing I want to I want to read, this is a quote I read in an interview with uh, Ryan Johnson. You might know him as the director of... Um, Last Jedi <laughs> and Knives Out, Last Jedi, Knives Out, and Looper. He's a writer. He wrote those scripts. He directed them. And it says, this is a, this is from the article. It says, after Looper, Johnson had an exciting idea for a sci-fi film, but after spending over a year trying to crack the script, he couldn't get anywhere with it. He says, I had the concept for it, but looking back, I realized I kind of put the cart before the horse, like I was kind of seduced by what was cool about the idea, but I didn't have a grasp on the heart of it or what was what it was really about. Um, and so uh, he says, he goes on to say, I'm still hoping I, I'll make up, I'm still hoping I'll wake up in the middle of the night and say, aha, it's this. Um, but uh, he's... He, as far as we know, I mean, that, that thing's not going to happen. He's working on other Star Wars films. He's, he's done that other thing. I look at him because he is someone creatively that I admire and I like his films and I like uh, his work ethic and I like his creativity and knowing that this is a guy who suffers from the same thing that every creative suffers, but not every idea he, he touches is gold, but there's just some ideas that you have to like, tuck away and put away. Um, so looking at that, one thing I want to make sure we don't confuse when you're looking at this, don't confuse um, uh, passion for a project with, what was my note, with momentum for a project. So sometimes you can lose momentum on a project, but not lose passion for it. And momentum might be a bunch of different variables are at play here trying to get in the way of you finishing that project and, and perhaps hang on to that, that passion for it. But sometimes there's really legitimate reasons for the momentum of the project to stop. And it's okay to let those uh, take effect in your life. Um, and, uh, and you can always return to it, revisit it when when some of those obstacles are moved out of the way. So I, I just want to outline that first, but let me ask you guys this. What, so Lee, you said, what was the reason that you, you abandon these, uh, these projects? Is there like a, a number one reason or is there, there is definitely the number, number one reason. I mean, but, because I can look back to, I can look back to my school experience. Now school's a very special time in my opinion, or if you're in just the learning mode, you don't have to be act, enrolled in a school. What I'm saying is the learning phase. The biggest thing, difference between the school I went to and I think a lot of other schools, including the ones that I've taught at, was Art Center gave you four four semesters of absolutely brutal foundation work, mm -hmm. and then literally like like switching on or off a faucet. The next term we came back and they're like, "Make what you want to make," and we did that <laughs> for two years. There was never an assignment given; mm -hmm. you had to come up with it. And it was fantastic because, but what happened at the end of that two years is everybody had been traveling their own road for two years. And so when it came time for, you know, the final graduation, everybody's work looked in so different because we had gone mm. in such divergent paths, but I finished everything during that two years. There was never a project where I started it and bailed on it. Now the projects were shorter and easier than the projects I attempt now, but I had a very high success rate of them. And, uh, and then immediately you go into the professional world. And the number one reason for most of the projects I haven't done is because a client can't see the same vision that mm -hmm. I am seeing with it, or they dilute it in a way that I'm not comfortable with. So it gets it, it sort of like your, what that story you were just telling, there was one uh, dummy that I had illustrated a number of times, like five or six times, finally got interest from, uh, from, a couple of publishers, one of them really ran with it. I made probably 15 full dummies with maybe eight or nine full rewrites. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
And then ultimately they passed on it. Now I'm just looking at it going, well, I go back to like version one. I'm like, that's the one I like the best still. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But they tried to put a bully in there. They tried to, you know, workshop it with their marketing team and all that stuff. And, and then, so what do you do with it? Now it's made the rounds at the different publishers. It's already been, oh, we like it, but we're not going to do it now because we already got something similar kind of reasons or whatever. And then it just sort of goes away. Now that same project I, I said, there's enough interest there. I have enough interest there where I, I'm going to go ahead and make some paintings. And I made those paintings and I sold all the originals and I continue to sell prints just for the three or four sample picks for that picture. So I know there's an idea there, um, but it, it's mainly to answer your question. It's because the professional rejection, it's just really hard to get something all the way through. Mm-hmm. What about personal projects? Uh, ones where it's it's not contingent on an editor or a writer or marketing team. Yeah, that's what I'm sort of going through now, actually. So it's an interesting topic to bring up. Um, there's opportunity cost. And for those of you mm-hmm. not familiar with that, it's whenever you make a decision to do one thing, you've now said no to all the other things. Mm-hmm. Well, now that I'm kind of taking a break from professional children's books in terms of being paid for with clients and stuff, I have to self-initiate some projects for my gallery. And I'm kind of just uh, dragging my feet a little bit because I don't really know which one to dive into. So there's a little bit of confusion about how deep do I go with it? Because the second I turn that on, it's got to be worthy of, you know, six months worth of work. Yeah. Yeah. Will, what about you? What, what are the reasons? Is there a number one reason your projects get abandoned? There's a there's a bunch. I was just gonna hit screen share for those that are on YouTube. <laughs> so this is this is some art from the game that I was working on called Super Stick. That's cool. And I put four. Describe what it looks like. It's a side scrolling game. We were working with Microsoft. We had mm-hmm. a dev kit. We had everything. We had a team of five people. Um, we had music from David Housden, who's an award winning musician for game that's won awards in games and stuff and anyway we had so many cool things going on in this game and we had to eventually abandon it um because these are awesome there's a a biting (laughs) strawberry if for those of you guys you should go to our youtube channel and check some of this artwork out it's like a spiky it's all dangerous (laughs) food it's dangerous food is what it is (laughs) and and the idea behind this game was so fun it was it was like a end of days where we have so many animations uh end of end of days where the nuclear fallout has created uh, mutations in a food factory and so super stick is the is was the the night security guard who was trying to escape the building without getting eaten by all the gargantuan mm-hmm. food that was coming after him so it's just it's just it's just crazy we we came up with so many crazy things and these things all were um were dangerous things that i'm the things i'm showing on the screen right now or do the uh, chicken i want to see the chicken where's the it's, where's good, the, it's good looking right stuff it's right you. straight up oh yeah the, there we go the chicken laid these eggs with spikes and stuff and then, <laughs> the chicken's head is cut off and hooked yeah. to a, a tube <laughs> wow. anyway anyway it was super fun and I learned a ton, but what we, what the, basically we really learned was we didn't have enough manpower, um, on the programming development side. And the, mm-hmm. the guy that was programming, it was really good. And he has gone on to do other great projects and make a lot of money. And, but he, he just, he didn't realize the scope of what we were doing, you know? Mm-hmm. And so we had to abandon this just because we just didn't have the manpower to do it which was, it's a different, you know, I didn't predict that happening Mm -hmm. and obviously neither did him. We wouldn't have spent all this time, but it was a labor of love. And I would love to still complete this someday. Um, We, we had the, you know, the other thing was we kind of missed our window right when the, I can't remember what Xbox it was that came out, but Mm -hmm. there were no games for it. And there were no mm-hmm. games available and we, and we were trying to time it. So ours would be one of the first and that's yeah. what Microsoft was working with us and everything was so exciting, but for the fact that we just end up 
ended up biting off more than we could chew. So that's one reason. Yeah. You might have to abandon a project. Another one for me is I've abandoned a lot of story books, you know, children's picture book ideas because, and you, I guess you could say for the same reason, no, not the same reason, a little bit different. I didn't feel like I had the skill. Um, mm-hmm. So I was writing these stories and when I would workshop them in my critique group, there were problems that I did not know how to fix in the, in the actual story arc. Like narrative problems. Yeah. yeah. And, and I got to a point where I was like, I like the idea. I like the subject matter, but I can't make a story that, that if I can't get my critique group excited about it, mm-hmm. I'm not going to send it, to go through the process of right. me and sending it to an editor. So I just realized that I needed more time um, writing stories and, and why not? Why, you know, any, any amazing skill that you develop, you could make that argument, the 10,000 hour rule argument, you know, if you, I mean, like, how many hours do you have, Lee, in disc golf? <laughs> the number that's too big to count to. What do you have? You ever ca- tried to count it up? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's. Uh, I haven't tried to count it up. But I don't know if it's ten thousand. If it's ten thousand, I'm 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 behind the the curve of of accelerating my skill set. <laughs> right. I, I, be just, <laughs> I just want to point out how far you two have come. Will called it disc golf. <laughs> and not froth. Like, that's pretty good. It's pretty you good. two have come you know, a long way. I will, say, I will say this: I've sort of abandoned a little bit of disc golf. Now I'm in. I'm back into mountain biking. Oh, mm. some new trails opened up near my house, well, and they are good. The reason and they're I huge. That's cool. The reason I didn't call it froth is because we're in tough times right now. You know, it's yeah, so sensitive. Intense. I'm a snowflake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just didn't want to push lee over the edge right hey uh um, while we're to, while we're talking about this i wanted to run uh, well, well let me let me try oh, ahead, that, that last yeah. thought is, is that i probably only have a few hundred hours writing children's stories i don't have anywhere near enough and mm. so i finally came to the terms of until i have time to really spend time like days and days and days writing I'm not going to come up with something that I like on my own. Mm-hmm. I really need to spend a lot of time doing that. Yeah. And I need to be able to afford to spend that time. I, I, I want to mention something here. It's kind of segue. Uh, to, I want to ask you guys something about, about that specific thing, a little bit off topic, but when you're in a critique group or you're submitting narratives to a publisher, sometimes they go deeper than they need to in terms of analyzing what a kid's story is. I don't know oh. if you guys have ever noticed that. So, so, you know, a lot of the the pushback I get is, uh, you know, say a character goes on a journey and that's the kind of book it's going to be, this kind of quest. And the publisher says, well, why did they go on the quest? Or, or, or you know, <laughs> what, what, pro- you know, the, the, and, and I always push back with, well, you know, why did Pigeon want to drive the bus? It's never, <laughs> it's never stated. It doesn't say that right. he had a childhood trauma and he needs <laughs> to drive buses. He just wants to drive the bus. And sometimes you, I think in kids' books, you should be able to just say, they wanted to do something or, or they're, I mean, I like motivations. I don't want to say that that's, you know, totally discounted, mm-hmm. um, but there is a motivation. And then, but then they want to dig deep. Like, I mean, like, like psychoanalyze your character a little too much when most of the books that are successful, you know, why, why does, uh, why does the bear want his hat back so much? What, who gave him the hat? Like we never right. learned that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, they the want to go book. the uh, where the wild things are route is like oh does Man, he come from deep. a broken home right is it, <laughs> so parents are dead or something I don't know um, anyway I just wanted to make that point because that that comes up a bunch and then that's why I lose enthusiasm for it because now I'm digging for something that I don't think necessarily helps the narrative it almost complicates it a little too, bit more with that because I've gotten that before too and I wonder if it's like the editor knows that this book's going to be re- read by their editor friends <laughs> knows it's going to be read by Kirkus <laughs> reviews and uh and and they want it, well it depends there's some publishers that are just like let's do a fancy Nancy let's get it out there let's sell a ton of these books doesn't have to be deep, just has to be fancy. You know, mm-hmm. let's just have to get girls excited <laughs> to dress up. Right. And then there's other publishers that are like, let's, you know, let's sell a book that, that 
wins an award and it's it's cerebral you know it's like it 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 explains the human condition on a level that both children's and their parents can you know can understand and there's room for both of those i can dig that it just seems like sometimes they're mining for something that's like Well, yeah, my agent always says there's two, like there's two routes you can go in publishing. There's, you want to publish award winners or do you want to publish like books that sell? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like, like, that's what you're, that's what you meant with fancy Nancy, right? It's like a A commercial driven project. Yeah. It's essentially commercial versus, you know, uh, critical. Right. Well, see, I like the critical ones too. I just think I just think that that stops a lot when you overanalyze what every mm-hmm. single thing. I mean, sometimes it's just a quick hit to get your character going into the, what the yeah. story is going to be. Mm-hmm. You dive yeah. too deep. Now you got to add pages. Well, that takes out where the story was going. And so, I mean, they also the thirty-two page sort of self-limiting um, format of children's books. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes forty pages is what you need. It's exactly what you need. Mm-hmm. And now mm-hmm. that at this stage of my career, I can ask for that extra eight pages. But that's early, really, it's like, oh, no, you, you went over 500 words. Oh, you went over 32 pages. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that brings up another thing. Have you guys ever, have you guys ever shelved a project because you self-censored it because you thought you could hear what the editors were going to say about it? Like mm-hmm. you thought they're going to say, there's no market here. There's no you can't do that in children's publishing. Have you ever had that? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah there's been where I'm like, what, who is this actually for? Like mm-hmm. I, I, I am always geared towards um, things like you look at Tintin, right. Which mm-hmm. came out. It's French. It came out uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, whatever. And it was this beautiful, like combination of very realistic environments, but, and and very realistic, like world, um, locations around the world. But then you have these very cartoony characters that are very simply drawn. Mm -hmm. Then you have this like adventure, like the, the main characters, this news, uh, reporter, and he gets caught up in these, uh, these adventures. And I always liked, that idea and i want to do stuff like that but the market for a book that came out in 1955 in france is not the same as someone putting out a book in you know 2020 in the us like there, there's 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 not overlap there so i'm always trying to like figure out okay um and there's always this balance too like do you do something that you're passionate about Mm-hmm. passionate about but do you also do something that fits the marketplace and and if you you know the venn diagram if there's an overlap with those two things pursue the thing where they overlap because you will mm-hmm. have success and you want to be successful because it leads to more of you doing what you you want to do right mm-hmm. um but i do like pull back because I, I think about like okay who's really gonna want um who's really gonna want something that's cute but for grown-ups you know, mm. like something that looks like it's for kids, but it's actually for adults. And not that there would be anything. I don't, know. I, I don't you know. like thinking like that because I always think to myself, and maybe it's just like ego driven or self perception driven, but I always feel like if I'm excited about something, somebody else will be as well. Well, and that's a good point too, because um, if you want to go the traditional route, uh, traditional publishers want to sell a hundred thousand or a million books to to somebody right so your idea has to be appealing to a million people so that that those book sales can pay for the marketing team can pay for their law counsel you know can pay for the the head editor and the assistant editor and the art director it's a big machine to run right yeah and most importantly the um the rent in manhattan right Right. so so it's got to pay for all those things and then you know, the, the creator is going to get their 5% royalty or whatever. Um, but if you think, okay, if there's 2000 people who love this thing that I love and a Kickstarter, you're going to, you know, you're going to do great on a Kickstarter selling 2000 copies of a book. That's like, that's a good amount of money. And, and even worth the little bit of extra work it does to like build it yourself, get it printed yourself and ship it yourself. Right. Um, so I think there's, I think too, like before you decide to abandon something, 
there's a few like criteria you need to look at. Number one, first and foremost, I think, are you still passionate about it? Like if they're still passionate there, then go and find a way to make it happen. Mm -hmm. But don't confuse, like I said at the beginning, don't confuse that passion with momentum. Like, oh, no one's going to buy this book, so I should just stop. Well, if you're still passionate about it, maybe there's a way to bust through that momentum that's that's like hindering you. So, so number one, I think, make sure you're still passionate about it. Number two, and and the passionate thing, I think, looking at that, you go back into thinking, um, what was it that inspired this idea in the first place? And and I think there you can unpack two things. Number one. Were you inspired because this is something you really want to make and this is something you want to spend your time working on and this is something you want to put out into the world? Or were you inspired by the idea of, I like the idea of having a book published and that book winning an award. I don't care what book it is. Yeah, I just want to have this thing published. And sometimes that second one isn't enough to get a project finished. It's no good. It does not because. Every project is going to go through this valley of death where it's like the only thing that gets you working on it is you want to see it made. You want to see what you're actually working on happen, happen. You don't, and you don't care if it wins an award or if it sells a a thousand, hundred thousand copies or anything. You just want to have this thing exist in the world. Then there's the other passion where it's like, I like the idea of having a best selling book. I like the idea of, you know, Yeah, that's not going to, that's not going to work, but I, I, I do right. like that model that you did with Skyheart, mm-hmm. where you could have had it gone the traditional publishing route, but you didn't. And then you're correct me if I'm wrong, but, but you released it in increments. And so you did get the, hopefully avoiding that valley of, of death because you release it in increments. Then you get a little shot of adrenaline, like, Hey, okay, people are liking this. They're commenting on this. Okay. Now I'm ready to do the next section. And you almost get excited about releasing those sections versus sometimes with what we do, you can be holed up for a year. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever seen the project and Mm -hmm. you're just trying to finish it. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Well, I mean, some of the greatest, uh, let me just say this and then don't forget your thought. Will. some of the greatest works of fiction were released serially, you know, Sherlock Holmes was released serially. Um, I want to say like Frank, was it Frankenstein? I, a lot of these like classics were released a piece at a time in anthologies or in publications or things like that. And then once they had a full story, they published a book of it. Yeah. Uh, I know the Martian uh, written by um, what's his face? Uh, I forget the the author for that, but I heard Ed, Edgar Allan Poe was like that too. Yeah, short the, stories the, and then and then kind of the grouping. The guy who wrote The Martian, though he he was releasing a chapter at a time online, oh, like that's killer. on his blog or something like that, you know, on forums. Um, but go ahead, Will. What were you going to say? Well, I was going to piggyback on what you were saying, which is um, the idea that they're. There, there might not be a commercial market where uh, an editor or a marketing team in a in a publisher publishing house might not think there's that it's a, that it's got broad enough appeal so it gets canned and i had that early on when i submitted a story called penguins at play where the the penguins were being scared by this sea lion and and the sea lion was always coming around and and you know as a dad I watch my kids and they love to be sort of scared a little bit. You know, there's, there's a fine line, right? Mm-hmm. Where kids like being scared, not, they don't like being terrified, but they like being right. a little scared. And you see that where, you know, if you're in line at the grocery store or at a bank or something, and you see a little kid hiding behind its, in its mom's or dad's legs and peeking out at you. And if you look at it and make a face, you know, the kid will, hide again, but it'll always come back and look again. Mm-hmm. Cause they like being scared, right? We, within, within the confines of safety. So I wanted to write a book where I could read it to my kids and they, they would be a little scared, but it would all work out in the end, you know? Mm-hmm. And I kept getting this comment. It's too scary. It's too scary. This right. you know. And I was thinking it's too scary. Too much, too much blood. Yeah, no, no, there was no blood. <laughs> it's too scary for you. But it's not too scary for a lot of people who I know would really like this because I'm not insane, right? I mean, yeah. 
<laughs> There's other people like me out there. And that's one thing that I do really like about crowdfunding uh, a project that you're really passionate about is there are, this is like the first time in the history of the world where someone that isn't already wealthy can figure out a way to bring yeah. a product to market to find that niche. Mm-hmm. Man, it's, it's so cool when people figure out something that's, you know, I, just, I mean, not even talking about art and books, but like you go to Kickstarter or any of these crowdfunding things. And sometimes I just, I don't know if you guys do this, but you just kind of look around mm-hmm. and then you'll see somebody make something. And you're like, man, that is smart. You know, yeah. it's just, it's just really, really cool. On that same note, you know, what Scott Robertson put out a, um, a drawing book a number of years ago, I guess five years ago, maybe now. And, you know, in his book, there was, there's videos attached to the book and you, you know, you scan the Q code, I guess the Q code never really took off as much as they <laughs> thought it was going to, but, um, but the book is interactive in a way that's different than publishing was before that. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, that got me thinking too, like, you know, is now that we're not locked into the 32 page format, you know, what, if I look to my, my bookshelf right now over there, I see technique books. I see children's books that I like. I see art of books from concept development. What if you combine all those, all three of those things? Now, then all of a sudden my like adrenaline goes up and my excitement goes up. Like that would be a cool children's books to have the children's book, have the making of the children's book, have a tutorial that's linked to a video and, and real publishers aren't doing that. And so, I mean, I think that's also why I'm a little bit hesitant before I pick the next thing, because man, that could be, the formats are all changing at this point. Mm-hmm. Right, right. I have another thing too. I, I was talking to a friend of mine and th- this may be a, a little bit of a different topic, but I was talking to him about like, lately I felt a little lost career-wise as far as uh, I've been doing children's books for 10 years. I've been doing, um, prior to that, I was in animation, but I've been doing concept art off and on little odd jobs. I've been working, you know, on Inktober stuff and kind of building the Inktober brand and all that sort of thing. Um, these past 10, six, eh, probably 10 years since I left animation has been a, a career shift. And now I'm feeling like I need another shift in career. You know, this, hmm last six or seven years been working on svs and building that i'm not saying this is me like guys i'm out of svs (laughs) i just want to announce it (laughs) but but i was just saying like i just feel like i need uh, and here here's really what it is and uh, maybe i feel a little vulnerable talking about this i've been so focused on um the the business side of art for the last six seven years um, so focused on how do I get, um, how do I get a stable income? How do I get like, um, uh, recurring revenue? Um, mm-hmm. you know, how do I get a shop up and running? How do I get the Kickstarter machine going? You know, how, how do I do all these things? And I've been very focused on that and time management and project management and administrative stuff that my art has atrophied. I used to have like every year, these big aha breakthroughs, like, Oh, I can do this now, or I understand this now. And I'm applying that to my work. And I got to this level where I was like, okay, my artwork is good enough where I can, it's good enough and efficient enough that if I just stay at this level, whatever I can do can suffice. (laughs) It can pass. You know, I can pass it on. Good enough. Right. It's good (laughs) enough. And lately I've been feeling like, man, I don't feel satisfied with my abilities. Like I, I, I see people getting better and doing things that I wish I could do that I'm not doing. And, uh, anyways, I was talking to about this with my friend and he brought up a point. He's like, okay, I have a, he had a cousin, uh, still has a cousin. She's five years ahead of him. She, um, you know, she's super, um, uh, accomplished in the same amount of time. No, she's not, she's five days. I saw, I'm sorry. I said five years. She's five days ahead of him, but might as well be five years. She's five days older than him, but she got her PhD in the time that he got his master's, you know, she went on to be a doctor while, you know, he, you know, he's always sort of compared himself to her and she sort of had the same thing. She got really sick. She was down for a week with the flu. And she was saying to her mom, she's like, I just don't know 
if this is the direction I want to go, and maybe I should shift my life and, and, and do something. And he said, his mom's reply to her or her mom's reply to her was don't ever make a life decision while you're sick. <laughs> okay. Wait until you get better. Wait until you feel good. And then you can, your head's clear and you can think about this. And he said, right now we've been, our culture and our society has been sick. We've been locked inside for most of the year. We've been dealing with social problems, political anxiety, all this kind of stuff. Our society isn't like, we wouldn't say it's healthy right now, would we? Right. <laughs> not, not thriving in the way that not it thriving, is. not healthy. There's a lot of aggravation. People have anxiety. I mean, you just sent me that link to uh, how to deal with anxiety, right? Because apparently you're just crippled with anxiety right now, Lee. You can't. <laughs> even, no. no, but but he said, um, and he said, I know so many people right now in their in this their 40s age, late 30s, early 40s, who are like shifting gears, wanting to shift career, wanting to move on to something else. And um, and he said, wait till we get through this fog that we're in before you make any life decisions. And I thought that was like really good advice. And I think that applies too with when you abandon something and decide you should move on. Like if you're in a weird spot, you know, you've been working on this project and then you get sick, you know, for lack of a better term, or you, or your life changes a certain way. Um, Maybe you push pause on it, but that doesn't mean that project is done and and forgotten. Wait until things change, wait until things go back to how they were, or go back to a new level where you're able to, to do stuff. And then you can pick it back up again. But that's a good point. Caveat. If your life has changed, it's okay to abandon something and move on it. You don't need to like hang on to something just because you're passionate about it yeah. once, right? Well, we should talk about that. Why, why other people that we've seen abandon stuff, abandon them. I'm thinking um, specifically of students of mine. Mm-hmm. And the number one abandonment that I've seen as a teacher looking at students is people bailing out of animation specifically. Mm-hmm. And it's just interesting because what happens, and I'll just use this as an analogy, it could be anything, but this is just specific to what I've seen. They get into animation and then they get into classes where they have to draw, you know, what is it, 24 frames a second or whatever. And they just, it's just a lot of repetitive drawing to make, a, you know, a one minute short Mm-hmm. You know, you see a student go through that, you'll know really quick whether they're going to be good in animation or not, not because of the technical skill, but just do they even want to be there? And many times, yeah. um, I'd say 50% maybe, they what it really is, is they like animation. They're, mm-hmm. They don't want to actually make animation. Mm-hmm. And so then we can have really good conversations about well, what kind of art do you like to make versus what do you like to look at? And sometimes mm-hmm. those aren't the same thing. And sometimes you have to go as far as going into art school to find out you're in the wrong place. Correct. Mm-hmm. And there's, and there, and I've seen a lot of students that have sh- what I read as shame in the fact, you know, they're like, look down at the ground and like, well, I'm not doing that thing anymore. Okay. Well, yeah. what are you doing? What, you know, I mean, celebrate the fact that you found out what you don't want to do. That's one thing right. you can cross off your list. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, don't be, don't feel bad about it. Yeah, you yeah. have to sometimes you have to walk down a path or go down a trail to know it's not it's not leading you to the the destination right. that you want particularly or you might just I mean honestly with all these careers there's no destination it's just you enjoy that trail right. <laughs> like if you don't right. like the view you don't like the terrain you know go find a different trail and that that's okay I um, do want to at some point talk about and you can stop me if this is the wrong time to talk about it but basically with talking about students and watching what they complete versus what they don't complete Mm -hmm. as far as let's just wanted to talk about individual illustrations. Yeah. I see, I see the problems both ways where students will finish and want to rework a a drawing or a, a composition or a painting that can't be resurrected in its current state because the composition is so bad that, you're wasting time to keep working on it. Well, mm-hmm. I appreciate the commitment. I like to tell students it's time to start. Oh, if you want to do this illustration, right, wad it up and throw it away mm-hmm. or set it aside and start from scratch and take what you've learned that doesn't work. And let's start over from the beginning and get a composition that's working versus 
Correct. I see students that constantly start on an idea and maybe it's for the competition that we have um, our critique arena competition where we have a prompt and I'll see students start an idea and then they start another idea and then they abandon that idea and they start another one and then they start another one. And that's not necessarily bad either. As long as you are the, the reason for stopping is that you don't like the idea anymore. But if it's because the, the design process got hard and you can't come up with a way to design it, so you switch ideas, that's not good either because now you're avoiding learning how to, to solve a problem. Like if you're, if, as an illustrator, if you're given an illustration assignment, you're given a problem to solve. You can't say, can I have another problem to solve? This one's hard. <laughs> you have to solve that problem. And so when you come up with a good idea to solve a problem, it's you have to stick with, that's when you do have to stick with it. I so think I that's, one, to, that's one of the little snags with social media is that is that I think because of the tidal wave of really good images just comes at such a rapid pace. I think mm -hmm. sometimes people think that it, they're just seeing the finished product. They didn't see the struggle to get there. Mm -hmm. And so it looks like it was effortless for everyone else. And so maybe you aban they abandon early. Even if, here's what's funny too. Like I've been watching a lot of uh, tutorials lately in an effort to up my craft, <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, a lot of, uh, um, you know, a lot of these videos where people go through their process and they're sped up a lot of times because it's maybe takes two or three hours to finish, but they only want to share a 15 or a 10 minute video. And really, I don't have time to watch three, <laughs> three hour video. So you watch this 15 or 10 minute video and you still you get in your head like, man, they're so fast. Yeah, they can do it, this it, so... was, it was linear. Like they never made a bad mark. <laughs> yeah. You miss all the like, uh, let me walk away from this and come back to it. It's just sped up. So yeah, I think social media on the one hand, very good because it exposes you to what the bar is and what people are, are doing, what, what you can, you can get good at. And also exposes you to a lot of technique because a lot of people share those things. And on the other hand, you know, there is this, uh, imposter sort of syndrome that's real. Like I'll never be that good. I'll never get, mm -hmm. get as well as them or, you know, how can they accomplish so much, you know, at that such a young age or in such a little time or whatever. That's a good point. I guess I will keep talking. Um, <laughs> well, I, I have an alternate, I, I didn't know, I didn't know when to bring it up, but, but there's a specific now. issue that I'm, I'm thinking of with that big pause. I'm thinking it is now. Um, I had a student that this is the opposite side of what we're talking about here where they won't give up when they mm -hmm. should give up. And, and it, in this particular instance, a, a student took a, a children's book illustration class with me and, and David Hone, this is a number of years ago. And it was decent enough for a first stab at a dummy and, and got some finished art out of it or whatever. And then I, you know, I run into them at like an SCBWI conference, like, you know, six months later, their portfolio is that. And then I see them a year later and it's still that. And they, I mean, like probably two or three years and they're just, that's the one story. They're like, this is my thing. It's my, yes, it's my star Wars. It's my Harry right. Potter. Right. And the, and it's it. There's no, there's no plan B. There's no story two. It's just that. And, and I just think to myself, man, how long are you going to beat that horse before you, uh, you know, trade it in and try something else? I've seen that a lot in, in yeah. teaching in, um, children's book conferences, um, back to back years at writing for young readers. But this was like 10 years ago. And I saw some of the same people attend. And then the next year they attended and they were working on the same story project. And if you, if you compare that to the story I told in the beginning of Rick Walton, who had written 1100 stories, give or take, that's, I, I don't really understand that. Um, I don't understand the people that have that one thing that they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know. I think maybe it's, it's the idea, or like you said, the dream of one day having something published, but the, the, in reality, those that get things published are constantly working on, I think there's also this, this fairy tale that we hear all the time 
where the 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 author had 100 rejections from every major publisher. That's what I was thinking of too, yeah. And and then finally, you know, here's this acceptance letter and they they did it and then they went on and wrote this best-selling series and because it's, you know, they 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 persevered and they 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 pushed through. Um I think and that and while that does happen, I mean uh, that's was the case of even like star wars we i mentioned star wars and harry potter you know yeah, harry those potter. ideas were so out of out of left field and nobody could see how people would you know it, they kind of just like you want to do a space fantasy no space is sci-fi it's not <laughs> fantasy and harry potter is like well you know where's the you know fantasy is supposed to be over here with the wizards, not like right, right. a school of kids, but like we're off yeah. in this fantasy world. Right. And then it just takes one person to like, Oh, I get the vision. Uh, I'm going to do it. But a lot of times if you think it keeps getting rejected, it just might be bad. Right. <laughs> it just how, really how might, do you... <laughs> it really just might be bad. So here's my, here's, I think, I think you need to get in your head right now. You're not going to be a person that has one story. Well, here's is Jake frozen? Oh, he no. was for a second. You guys are frozen. I would no. say this: you were frozen. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to be the person who has one story. You're going to be that person who has ten stories, or you're going to be that person who has a hundred stories. And just get get your mind head around that. I'm going to work on this one. Oh, it got rejected. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make it better. But also, I'm going to allocate. Yeah, here's another one. Work on this next thing because so, guess what? When when you do get rejected. It might be this letter. It might be, we don't like this because it does, you know, we're already publishing a book just like this. What else do you have? If you have nothing else, then you're, you're out of, you know, you're out of it. Good point. Um, yeah. Or if you do do something and it does get published, um, you know, they're going to say, well, what's book number two or what's book number three or, or whatever. So go ahead, Will. Well, I think I just figured it out. Just Epiphany while just happened right now. So tell us yeah. what the... did you see? The little, there were like little twinkly stars. I I did. I, it was like a light came in through your window. Yeah, yeah. It and it gave me the answer to this whole thing, and that is that the person that brings the same project back a year later doesn't really wake up in the morning thinking I get to work on this project and then works on it. Mm -hmm. Because they did, and that's my criteria actually for resurrecting old projects, um, or or the projects that I've shelved for a while, is when I finally have time for them. Am I at a point where I can? I am so excited to get up in the morning to work on this thing that mm -hmm. that it's in my mind. It's what I'm thinking about during the day when I can't work on it, and that's what they don't have. There's no way they can like that someone that's working on a project. Or that brings the same project around a year later has spent any time on it because they didn't lie awake at night thinking I right. get to work on this tomorrow. Right. It's it's why it hasn't changed. Yeah. Yeah. Lee, were you gonna did you have something to piggyback on that or no? He just had that so, look, you know, like he had something to say. I always have something to say. I'm just, <laughs> so here's here's what I'm gonna say. If you have I'm gonna wrap this up. So we've been going a little while put, here. Put a bow on it. Put a bow. I'm going to wrap this up, but here's what here's what I say. If you've got a project that you've been working on, and you've got two options, you either abandon it, abandon it, or finish it. Okay, and and I would say if you're going to finish it, do the the most viable, like easiest version of that, and get it get it off off your plate so you can go work on something out. And what that means is like, maybe you don't do the full graphic novel because the graphic novel is 120, 150 pages of comic story. And that takes a couple of years if you're working on it part-time, right? Maybe what you do is the world of X and it's all your concept art and it's all your notes. You make a little book, put it together and people can read through. And it's just an expl exploration of the world of what you're building. There's some story in there. There's some character design. There's some world design in there, whatever. If it's a children's book, just make, um, uh, I would say, polish the illustrations 
just enough and make a, a PDF finished with a cover, whatever, and go sell it in your um, on your big cartel site, your Etsy site, or just give it away. Just have it as like a freebie. You come to your site and you're like, hey, check out my book. Maybe it's a page, uh, a page that you have where you can scroll down and read through it just so that it exists and it lives and it's something somewhat a little bit more polished, a little bit more finished. doesn't have to be every illustration totally finished, but it could be like three key ones and then black and white illustration, something like that. So find a version of it. You can finish it and get it off your plate and move on to something else. So that's that. If you're going to abandon it, here's good reasons that you should abandon something. I've been writing them down while we've been talking. Mm -hmm. Number one, no longer passionate about it. Okay. You just don't have the passion for it. Okay. And that could be because has your lifestyle changed? Maybe you started this in college, this idea, and now you've got a kid and, and your kid just doesn't, um, give you the time to, to work on this anymore. It's okay to abandon it. You could put it aside. Maybe I your identities. That, I call yeah. that, that you've lost that love and feeling. <laughs> you've lost that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you've lost the love and feeling. Maybe your identity's changed. Like this story idea that you've had, um, is something written by someone who's cute and fuzzy, but now you do more edgy stuff. Okay. That's a good reason to abandon it. Or maybe just your priorities change. Maybe like for you right now, making, um, uh, money on a consistent basis, you know, month to month, a set amount of money is like more priority and you've got a job that's managing that. Um, and working on this is going to take away from that go ahead and abandon your project because priorities have changed. Okay. So that's it. Number two, maybe the scope, think about the original idea and maybe your scope has changed. Has it gotten bigger? Has it gotten, you know, has it turned into instead of a short story to a full, you know, I've got this idea for a character and now it's a short story and now it's a graphic novel. And now it's like nine graphic novels that you want to do <laughs> like dial back that scope and do the finished version of it or Go ahead and set it aside until that one day you have have time to do it. Number three, time is a factor. Maybe um, uh, I, th I, I guess actually I guess a, a life change could mean you just don't have time for it. Uh, the other thing is ability. Maybe your ability isn't there yet. Um, you're getting bad feedback from people. Your critique group isn't excited about it. Editor isn't coming back excited about it. Um, you can't crack the story. You can't, you just hit this wall where the, the vision that you have exceeds your ability, abandon it, go increase your, your craft, your ability, get better, and then maybe approach it when you're able to draw, you know, uh, the figure better. And this is a story that is mostly like humans happening in it or something. Um, and then, I would say, lastly, um, check and see if there's still a need for this project, if there's still a market fit for it, okay? So perhaps you're like, oh, I've got this idea for this great children's book. I'm working on it for so long. It's called Super Cute Nancy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or Where the Crazy Things Are, right? <laughs> and we already have Fancy Nancy. We already have Where the Wild Things Are. <laughs> um, maybe your idea, nobody really needs it. They don't need that version. Maybe you've got this thing called sun wars and it's all about this like <laughs> fantasy adventure in space. Right. Um, but take a good, honest look at it and see, okay. And what I creating is what I created here, just a, a version of what's already out there, or is it something unique enough that it, it does feel like a need for people? Okay. And it could be, you know, maybe, maybe your idea is it's star Wars, but it's all cute animals. I don't, is there something like that already? I don't know. Um, uh, don't steal that idea. I think I'm going to do that actually. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so just make sure that you, um, um, that it's still, yeah, there's still a, a viable audience for it. And if, and if it's just a small audience, maybe, you know, make sure you're okay with that. If it's like, well, there's got to be a thousand people who are into this thing that I'm into, then maybe that's okay. Maybe you do a Kickstarter and sell a thousand books. Cool. Um, I think that's it. Is there anything else you guys want to tack onto that? That's solid. Yeah, that, 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 that was good. I mean, I think people feel guilty a lot of times when they abandon something or they can't finish it. And I think it's helpful to know that even super successful people um, are doing the same thing. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I want to, maybe I'll just end with this for me is I love having projects that I'm thinking about working on mm-hmm. the projects mm-hmm. that I, that I've started. And I love having the problem of not having enough time to get going on them. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I, and I'm not even going to talk about what I did, but I, I took a step yesterday towards the completion of another project and it felt so good. Nice. Really? Yeah, for a new project. Now I'm curious. Well, it's I ordered that, um, bowling alley in your basement. I spent a little... <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a this is a project, an art project that I'm going to. It's a game, and uh, is it about is it about food no, that comes alive? It's not that one yet. I have to find it's the right. Called find a bigger team to finish that one. It's called real estate capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> no wait, there's a... <laughs> well. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just kidding. You guys will have okay. to see. But it's just it feels great to have and I and I, you know, I'm on my phone, I'll take notes if I get an idea. I love so that when I sit down to work on this thing and really, you know, I I will have a lot fleshed out. That that's the funnest part, I think. Before before you've run into the whatever the problems are gonna be, mm-hmm. you're just getting it and we're sort of ramping up about mm-hmm. there's potential still in front of it. Mm-hmm. I feel, yeah. It's it's weird, but I always equate that too with like, I like it when I'm owed money. It's a weird thing. Like I've finished a job and I haven't been paid yet. I like that expectation. And <laughs> it's kind of similar when they pay me. I mean, I'm not bummed when they pay me, but it just yeah. feels like it's all over. Like I like things that are sort of future based and that's how the projects. Yeah. I like being owed money by Lee. <laughs> no, I don't know. We'll see. The polls don't agree with that, but Hey, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you're in that honeymoon stage, Will. In yeah, honeymoon That's stage good, with the good, idea. Good phrase. Good, good way. But the problem there is that it does. It goes through this. The more you work on it, and the more you start finishing things, the more you realize it's not going to match that original vision. Right. Uh, but it's it. You have to like. I think the the pros are okay with it getting to like a finished version, even if mm-hmm. it didn't match that original mm-hmm. like. Like vision. My 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 challenge on this, on 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 just about every project is not jumping ahead and doing too much on the art side, mm-hmm. where I have an investment that I'm that I'm afraid to back away from. Yeah, and the, or where where the project will not need the art that I've done because it moves in a slightly different direction. Yeah. yeah can can you tell us off the record when we're done recording what it sure. is? Okay, cool. All right. Well, let's let's wrap it up. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Three Point Perspective is made possible by sfacelearn.com. We're becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts have been Will Terry, Lee White, and Jake Parker. Will Terry, you can find his work at willterry.com and uh, go to Instagram where he's found it at Will Terry Art. Lee White, go to his website, leewhiteillustration.com. And also follow him on Instagram at Lee White Illo. And I'm Jake Parker. You can go to my website, mrjakeparker.com and go to my Instagram account. It's at Jake Parker. Podcast is produced by Daniel Tu and his website is danieltu.co. So go, don't contact him for producing podcasts. He's already doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but you can take, uh, you can contact, he's a great filmmaker and an editor and things like that. So I'm sure he's always looking for, for something. Um, podcast shared by Lisa Fott over on social media. Special thanks to all Lisa that she does. And then uh, our SVS producer shall uh, we can't we can't let him go unnamed. That's uh, David Broad. Special thanks to him for all the work that he does to help SVS out. All right. If you like this episode, please share it around. Subscribe to it on iTunes. Leave a review. We love uh, hearing what you think. And if you're wanting to join in on this discussion, go log on to the svslearn.com forums where we've posted this episode in its own thread. If you're free to join, you can chime in over there and let us know your thoughts. That's it, everybody. We'll see you next time.